A pleasant good morning, everyone. My name is Renee Nelson. Welcome to the Department of History and Archaeology's annual CSEC lecture series. If anyone is unable to join us on Zoom, we're streaming live on our YouTube channel, History Uemona. We will now have the first of two sessions today for which I am the presenter. We will be looking at theme eight, Caribbean political development up to 1985. In particular, we will be focusing on popular protests in the 1930s. Our objectives are to explain the economic, political, and social factors which caused the protests, to discuss the consequences of the protests, and to highlight outstanding male and female personalities involved in the protests. These objectives relate to specific objective number two in your CSEC history syllabus. Now, before we jump in, it is important to note that the magnitude and level of the protests were not all the same. As such, different terms are used to describe what was happening in each territory. The larger protests are generally referred to as rebellions. These would include those in Jamaica, Trinidad, and Barbados. In the other territories, terms such as disturbance, riot, unrest, and disorder are usually used to describe the events. But all the protests are collectively referred to as either rebellions, that is the 1930s labor rebellions, or unrest, that is the 1930s labor unrest. The 1930s can be considered a watershed period, a defining period in the British West Indies, as these years laid the foundation for the region's modern nationalism movement by birthing modern trade unionism or organized labor and party politics. These years witnessed work stoppages, strikes, riots, and other labor disturbances and unrest in British Honduras, now Belize, Trinidad, St. Kitts, St. Vincent, St. Lucia, Barbados, Jamaica, Antigua, and British Guyana, now Guyana. The root of these laid in high incidences of unemployment and irregular employment and low wages, aggravated by the global economic depression of the, the 1930s, the closing off of economic migration opportunities and the return of migrants. There was also poor working conditions and the corresponding exploitative relationship between employers and employees, white capital and non-white labor, grounded in the history of enslavement and colonialism, ills for which there was a lack of recourse for workers and no effective means to settle labor disputes. Indeed, before 1932, trade unions were allowed only in Jamaica and British Guyana, and picketing was outlawed. It was in 1932 that unions were permitted in Trinidad and Tobago, Grenada, and St. Lucia, but limited in what they could do. Furthermore, there was a gender imbalance skewed towards males as women found it more difficult to gain employment except in domestic service, and when employed on estates, were not only underpaid, but labored under the most trying circumstances and given the more menial tasks. Race was also another factor that contributed to the rebellions, as the attitude of the whites caused resentment among Blacks who, inspired by Marcus Garvey and also Alexander Bedward in the case of Jamaica, and the 1935 Italian invasion of Ethiopia began to reject the racist ideology of their inferiority and develop an anti-colonial consciousness. The dismal state of affairs in the British West Indies existed since the abolition of slavery. Although free on paper, the constitutions were rigged to exclude the formerly enslaved black masses and their descendants from advancing in political economic and social life in order to preserve the status quo of minority white elite rule and for the benefit of the metropole, that is Britain. This included black disenfranchisement by virtue of the restrictive requirements of wealth 
and ownership of significant amounts of land in order to vote. As a result, political power rested exclusively in the hands of the whites. Hence, most blacks could hope for nothing more than a continuance in an agricultural existence, selling their labor and living in perpetual abject poverty. But many did not take this state of affairs lying down as evidenced in the Morante Bay Rebellion in Jamaica in 1865, where the oppressed rose up to challenge their poor economic, social, and political existence. Indeed, there was labor unrest in some territories in the early 20th century, such as the riots in British Guyana in 1905, and the 1930s labor rebellions were just a continuation to the challenge, or continuation of the challenge to the status quo to ensure workers' rights and improved conditions for workers. And as O. Nigel Bolland argued, the 1930s labor movement was a regional movement as it shared common causes and outcomes and leaders and activists. And we will now look at the individual territories, the first of which is British Honduras. In British Honduras, the major labor disturbances occurred in 1934 and 1935. Other instances of labor unrest occurred in 1936, 1938, and 1939. Most people were engaged in logging and lumber production, unlike those in most of the British West Indies, which were still involved in the sugar industry. With poor and irregular wages and a mostly unsympathetic government and employers, it was difficult to eke out a living. Indeed, reports surfaced of starving families and especially of hungry children. But enough was enough. And in February 1934, an organization, the Unemployed Brigade, was established and carried out a march with unemployed disaffected workers. The response of the colonial government was to pledge immediate assistance to the hungry and direct the unemployed to sign up for potential jobs at the Belize Town Board. But the government did not provide the dollar per day unemployment benefit that was requested, leaving the group dissatisfied. One man stood out during this unrest, and that was Antonio Soberanis Gomez, the father of the Belizean labor movement. Dissatisfied with the Unemployed Brigade, he went on to form the Laborers and Unemployed Association, the LUA, at a time when trade unions were not legally recognized. Soberanis Gomez petitioned the government to provide jobs for the unemployed at $1.50 per day. Towards this end, he led a roughly 3,000 people protest in August 1934 and organized a dock workers strike in the town of Stan Creek. This resulted in a wage increase, but conditions remained dismal for most workers, and Soberani Gomez and the LUA organized another strike in May 1935, this time among railway workers in Stan Creek for wage increases. He earned the ire of the colonial authorities, which penalized him for his labor activism. Penalties included imprisonment and the passage of a legislation banning marches without authorization from the police and the enactment of a seditious conspiracy law, which meant that it was illegal to criticize the government. Essentially, the LUA's mandate demanded employment opportunities and the establishment of a minimum wage for workers. It agitated on behalf of workers through actions such as strikes, petitions, demonstrations, and boycotts in order to force the powers that be to improve the lot of the working class. And at the same time, the LUA sought to meet the basic needs of workers by periodically arranging sustenance and medical care. All in all, the LUA laid the foundation for future trade unions and political parties in the country. The organization was, however, plagued by power plays within its ranks and the British Honduras Unemployed Association split from it. Moving on to Trinidad. In Trinidad, major labor disturbances occurred in 1934, 1935, and 1937. Workers were primarily engaged in the sugar, cocoa, and oil industries, with sugar employing the majority. 
Though the wages paid to oil field workers were more than those paid to sugar and cocoa, it was difficult to eke out a living right across the board. Widespread poverty, squalor, malnutrition, and racial prejudice were the order of the day. Employers passed on depression-era financial troubles to workers, but workers had had enough. In 1934, the National Unemployment Movement, which was formed the year before to agitate for government assistance for the unemployed and in reinstituting limits on property owners in terms of how much rent they could charge tenants, continued their activism. Likewise, the sugar industry experienced strikes, believable wages, and improved working conditions. Although the colonial government tasked the, wage board, the wages board in 1935 to look into the situation, the subsequent report was unacceptable to the workers as it did not recommend a legal minimum wage. And out of these labor troubles emerged a number of labor leaders. There was Tubal Uriah Butler, a Grenadian who was once an oil worker. He came to the forefront in 1935 when he led fired Apex Oil Fields limited workers in a hunger march to the capital port of Spain. He also formed the British Empire Citizens and Workers Home Rule Party, a political organization to rival the Trinidad Labour Party. And as conditions for the workers did not improve, Butler organized another strike in June 1937 that ballooned into violence when the authorities tried to arrest him and banned the meetings of oil field workers. The rebellion spread island-wide, involving sugar workers, coca laborers, waterfront workers, road workers, bus drivers, and street cleaners. Roads were blocked, telephone wires cut, windows of business places smashed. The police response saw protesters killed and wounded, and numerous arrests. Butler himself was later imprisoned. The rebellion forced the colonial government to acknowledge the poor state of affairs facing the majority of people and that employers needed to improve working conditions. A mediation committee was established to give workers the opportunity to voice their concerns. Out of this came an upsurge of trade unions registering, the first of which was the Oil, Fields, Oil Field Workers Trade Union in July 1937. There was also the All Trinidad Sugar Estates and Factory Workers Union, the Public Works and Public Service Workers Trade Union, the Seaman and Waterfront Workers Trade Union, and the Federated Workers Trade Union that were all established as a result of the 1937 Labour Rebellion. By the end of 1939, there were 13 registered trade unions and the newfound power of trade unions was fully on display. Aside from Butler, other notable leaders in the era include Captain Arthur Andrew Cipriani, who was well established before the 1930s. He headed the Trinidad Working Men's Association, which was formed in 1897 and renamed the Trinidad Labour Party in 1934. But by then, he was losing momentum with the workers for his more conservative approach as new, more militant leaders emerged. There was also Adrian Colarienzi, who emerged from the 1937 Labour Rebellion, first as a lawyer representing the arrested oil field workers on the request of Butler. But his role evolved to him leading the oil field workers trade union and the All Trinidad Sugar Estates and Factory Workers Union. There was also Elma Francois, who was born in St. Vincent, and Jim Barrett and Jim Headley, who featured prominently in the 1934 labor unrest and were very active with Francois and Barrett being imprisoned for the cause of labor in the ensuing years. They formed the National Unemployment Movement, which later became the Negro Welfare Cultural and Social Association. Clement Payne, who was later quite integral to the labor unrest in Barbados, formed the Federated Workers Trade Union and was also active in the National Unemployment Movement and the Negro Welfare Cultural and Social um, Association. And now we move on to British Guyana. 
Though not as extensive as what occurred in Trinidad, Barbados, and Jamaica, the 1930s labor protests in British Guyana nevertheless pointed to the fact that workers were no longer tolerant of being mistreated and taken advantage of by arrogant and racist employers. Workers were primarily engaged in the sugar, rice, and bauxite industries, with sugar employing the majority. With sugar, for example, workers who were primarily Indian, as in Trinidad, were undernourished, lived in deplorable dwellings, and lacked proper access to water. There was also wage gaps between the races on the sugar plantations, with blacks receiving slightly higher wages than the Indians. And although divided by race, the predicament of both blacks and Indians saw unity in protest on several occasions and indicated the development of a class consciousness in British Guyana. In 1934, there were strikes on four plantations and in 1935, seven demanding livable wages and improved working conditions. While the strikers on Plantation Leonora in 1935 one of the, with the, with the strikers rather, on Plantation Leonora, one of the chief concerns was the removal of an abusive and cruel supervisor. And there were strikes in 1936 and 1937, though fewer in number. In the absence of significant improvement, the Manpower Citizens Association was formed in 1936 and registered as a trade union in 1937 representing the interests of sugar workers, the first of its kind in the colony. And the following two years witnessed the formation of seven more unions, six of which were for specific sectors. The labor unrest in 1939 was the third for Plantation Leonara and witnessed protesters killed and injured. But this unrest was significant in that it contributed to the form that the labor movement and anti-colonial movement in the colony would take going forward in the 1940s. Some notable labor leaders include Hubert Nathaniel Critchlow, considered the father of trade unionism in British Guyana. There was also Yube Idon, who formed the Manpower Citizens Association. There was also A.A. Thorne, a Barbadian, who established the British Guyana Workers' League in 1931. There was also Joanna Harris, the first female president of the British Guyana Labour Union, and Eleanor Soden, vice president of the Manpower Citizens Association, both reflective of the fact that women too played a significant role in the labour movement. Now on to St. Kitts. St. Kitts experienced its share of labor troubles that reached the breaking point in 1935. What became known as Buckley's riots quickly spread throughout the island. It's, it started when, sugars, when sugar workers on Buckley's plantation rejected the poor wages offered for cutting cane. Violence ensued when several protesters were fired on by the manager and injured. When the police arrived, the workers demanded the arrest of the manager. As the crowd would not disperse, the riot act was read and the police fired into the crowd, killing three and wounding eight. 39 protesters were arrested and prosecuted. Like elsewhere in most parts of the region, trade unions had no legal standing to protect the interests of workers prior to and during the 1930s. But one chief outcome of the 1935 labor disturbance was that a number of candidates supported by the St. Kitts Workers' League won seats in the 1937 elections, thus demonstrating the growing power of labor unions. 1940 was when trade unions finally became legal under the Trade Union Ordinance of 1939 and the St. Kitts Nevis Trades and Labor Union established. Some notable leaders of the 1930s include Joseph Matthew Sebastian, one of the founders of St. Kitts First Trade Union, the St. Kitts Nevis Universal Benevolent Association. There was also Thomas Manchester, co-founder of the St. Kitts Workers League. There was also Joseph Alexander Nathan, the other founder of the St. Kitts Nevis Universal Benevolent Association. 
and there was Joseph Nathaniel, France. Moving on now to St. Vincent. Like St. Kitts, St. Vincent experienced labor unrest in 1935. In addition to the discontent with wages and working conditions, workers in St. Vincent protested tax increases on items used by the general populace, as well as high taxes on locally consumed sugar, the latter only beneficial to the wealthy sugar estate owners. This protest started on October 21 when the governor of the Windward Islands was presiding over the legislative council that was in session. Unlike the larger territories of the British West Indies, that is British Guyana, British Honduras, Jamaica, Trinidad and Barbados, which had individual governors, the islands in the Eastern Caribbean were split into two governorships, one for the Leewards and one for the Windwards. In the case of St. Vincent, as we see here on this map, it was part of the Windward Islands governorship. As the governor's headquarters was in Grenada, he was not a permanent fixture in the other islands, which he would visit from time to time. The crowd that gathered in St. Vincent's capital of Kingston, the location of the Legislative Council, then knew that they had to air their grievances to him as soon as he was in the island. The time was thus opportune as the governor would leave later that day to get back to Grenada. Hence, the people demanded that George McIntosh, a well-liked member of the Kingstown Town Council, petition the governor on their behalf. Although McIntosh informed them that he requested an audience with the governor, the people were suspicious as the meeting was stated to take place at 5 p.m. and the governor normally departed for Grenada before then. Feeling that the governor was not really willing to meet with them. Some pushed their way into the Legislative Council building, loudly voicing their concerns. We can't stand any more duties on food and clothing. We have no work. We are hungry. The session had to be adjourned and violence ensued as the Attorney General, who was responsible for putting together the new taxation measures and the governor were attacked. Windows in the building were broken and cars of some officials smashed. Adding to the mayhem was the release of prisoners from the nearby prison and the looting of businesses, shops and houses. The police response saw one killed and several wounded, but the riot spread to Georgetown and Chateau Belair, where telephone wires were cut and bridges destroyed. It took reinforcements from a British warship and other islands to suppress the unrest, but not before further spread over the next two days to Bayeras Hill, Camden Park, and Stubbs, where people demanded increased wages and land. There was also an important racial element to these riots, as several participants were vocally against the Italian invasion of Ethiopia. Other evidence of this were the names of the identified leaders. Sheriff Lewis, a.k.a. Selassie, and Bertha Mott, a.k.a. Mother Selassie. You know, these names reflected solidarity with the Ethiopians. And there were reports of protesters threatening, we'll lick all you white men come up tonight. We'll lick all you white men up tonight. Though he tried to maintain order, George McIntosh was prosecuted but acquitted for treason. And he emerged a popular leader. He formed the St. Vincent Working Men's Cooperative Association in 1936, although it could not be registered as a trade union. It nevertheless still managed to accomplish getting the government to take action on minimum wage, better working hours, and even the promise of a land settlement scheme by 1938. Another outcome of the labor unrest was the establishment of an unemployment bureau which, however, failed to provide adequate work opportunities. Now, on to St. Lucia. The governor of the Windward Islands had not one, but two labor unrest on his hands, as in November 1935, one month after St. Vincent, St. Lucian coal loaders struck in the capital of Castries for increased wages. But unlike that of St. Vincent, the protests did not expand. The governor informed the strikers that a wage increase was impossible because of the economic downturn, 
and because of the experience in St. Vincent, the governor overreacted and declared that the strike was race-based and issued an unwarranted state of emergency because there were alleged letters threatening whites and those that supported them sent in to the police. Military reinforcement from a British warship patrolled K Streets for several days and ensured that the workers went back to work. But nothing really changed for the workers. And in 1937, there was a large strike, this time on the sugar producing called the Sac Estate, which spread to the Rousseau Estate demanding higher wages. In 1939, the first trade union in St. Lucia, the St. Lucia Workers' Cooperative Union was formed by Charles Augustine, representing urban and agricultural workers. And now we look at Barbados. The Barbados Labour Rebellion occurred in July 1937, shortly after the one in Trinidad. And there was also a series of strikes in 1939. The working class struggled against unemployment and poverty, despite some improvements in labor relations between workers and employers when the government terminated the 1936 penal sanctions in the contract law. And the contract law is also known as the Masters and Servants Law, which existed since emancipation to keep the formerly enslaved, enslaved tied to the plantations. This law discriminated against workers by forcing them to work on estates for one year if they had worked five consecutive days there. They could only leave if they provided one month's notice. This took away the flexibility of workers to seek other employment on their own terms if they so desired. And similar laws existed elsewhere in the region. And although trade unions were not legal before 1940, there was Charles Duncan O'Neill, an early labor leader who died the year before the 1937 rebellion, who laid the foundation for the labor movement in Barbados. But it was, but it was the labor organizing activities of Clement Payne, who had been deported from Trinidad for the same, which triggered unrest in Barbados. Payne's speeches to the working class also reflected black nationalism as he spoke about the Italian um, invasion of Ethiopia, Garvism, and race relations. He also addressed the labor unrest throughout the British West Indies. Joining him at these meetings were Israel Lovell, a Garveyite, Fitzgerald Chase, Morty Mosquite, Darnley Allain, and Ulrich MacDonald Grant. The colonial government tried to get rid of Payne by deporting him to Trinidad. The justification being that Payne lied on his immigration arrival form that he was born in Barbados. Payne, who was born in Trinidad to Barbadian parents, had always considered himself Barbadian. He was nevertheless convicted and sentenced to three months. And while out on bail, he led a protest march to see the governor. But several people, including Payne, were arrested when the crowd refused to disperse on account of them not getting an audience with the governor. Payne's arrest was denounced and the protesters demanded his release. His supporters also amass amassed enough money for his lawyer, Grantley Adams, to appeal Payne's arrest, but the colonial authorities refused to release Payne and he was secretly deported back to Trinidad. When his supporters learned of this, mayhem ensued in the capital, Bridgetown. Vehicles and businesses were destroyed and the police were attacked. The rebellion spread throughout the island into the rural areas as other disgruntled and downtrodden workers reached their breaking point. Reports of food provision fields being raided and shop breaking pointed to the destitution of the people. Workers, including waterfront workers, bus drivers and conductors, took strike action as well, contributing to the unrest. The rebellion was eventually put down and in total, 14 people were killed and many injured. Hundreds were convicted and imprisoned, including Elaine, Lovell, Skeet, and Grant. Despite the rebellion, not much was done to improve the situation of the working class, and another series of strikes and destruction of cane fields for increased wages occurred in 1939. To alleviate the labor problems in the colony, a labor officer was appointed in that year, and trade unions legally received recognition in 1940. Out of the 1937 Labour Rebellion emerged Grantley Adams, who advocated for the disadvantaged, and he later became 
an integral part of Barbados getting self-government. The Barbados Labour Party formed in 1938 and was soon um, dominated by Adams. And now we move on to Antigua. The labor unrest in Antigua in 1939 was not massive, but it nevertheless reflected the fact that the working class would no longer tolerate poor working conditions. The disturbances that had been occurring in the region since 1935 were well noted in Antigua, and shortly before the 1937 rebellion in Trinidad, there was a strike for better wages by the dock workers. This result in a small, um, resulted in a small increase in said wages. Planters, anxious to avoid open rebellion, started taking steps for improvements in labor relations. Toward this end, the contract law was terminated in 1937 and the Antigua Recovery Program was established, providing small scale land for peasants to cultivate and a public um, works program was instituted for the unemployed. In March 1939, however, there were a series of strikes which started at the Antigua Sugar Factory, where the strikers wanted to unionize or you know, form trade unions for better wages. Although a small raise was granted with work resuming, a strike occurred at the Bendel's Sugar Factory also for increased wages. They were joined by field laborers on other estates and waterfront workers. Work ceased for two days and some cane fields were set on fire. However, police action stopped the disturbance and arrested 11 people. In the end, only the factory workers received a wage increase. There was more strike action in April with dock workers and porters and they too got a small wage increase. Out of these labor disturbances came the formation of the Antigua Trades and Labor Union with the passage of the Trade Union Act, which essentially legitimized labor organizing. The labor union was formed by Norris Allen, Berkeley Richards, Reginald Stevens, Harold Wilson, who also formed the earlier but short-lived Antigua Working Men's Association. And the union was also formed by Veer Beard. Verbird, who became president of the labor union in 1943. And last but not least, Jamaica. So Jamaica had suffered unrest in 1935 and 1937 when the banana workers in Arakabessa, St. Mary, rioted, and dock workers in Falmouth, Trelawney, and banana loaders in Kingston took strike action, but the disturbances in 1938 took an unprecedented level in magnitude and scope with the added ingredient of not only black racial consciousness, but also the reaction to joblessness created by returning Jamaican immigrants to the colony between 1930 and 1934. And a Serge Island sugar estate in the parish of St. Thomas was the first. In December 1937, cane cutters went on strike for a wage increase. Over the next few days, the numbers involved in the strike grew exponentially as hundreds, armed with machetes and sticks, demonstrated in the roads and held up vehicles, including trucks and carts carrying canes, and none from other properties was allowed to enter the estate. The strikers allegedly used threatening words to estate management and the color question was drawn in and threats were uttered against anyone who was not black. Fire was also set to four cane fields of the estate in a bid to force the owner to give in to their demands. Though the damage was not serious, the disturbance grew to such critical levels that police reinforcements were called in from throughout St. Thomas and from Kingston. And so earnest was the campaign of the cane cutters that owners of surrounding estates sent their families from the parish as they feared for their safety. This concern was not unfounded as a strike spread to the nearby Coley, Petersfield, Font Hill, Pembroke Hall, Stanton, and Oled estates, whose laborers also agitated for a wage increase. On January 6, 1938, the police descended on the crowd at Surge Island to disperse it and 34 people were injured and 63 arrested, thus bringing an end to the unrest. 
The immediate result of the events was a wage increase on um, Surge Island. And in the aftermath of what happened on Surge Island, strikes occurred on banana plantations in the parish, and these two were quickly settled with wage increases. But members of the working class elsewhere in the island, struggling with the same issues as those in St. Thomas, were ready to let their voices be heard as well. The first of which occurred three months later in late April at Frome Estate in Westmoreland. And Surge Island and the surrounding estates were again engulfed in riots, this time island-wide in May and June, for not only another increase in wages, but also an improvement in working conditions. Now, where did it begin in from? In 1937, the London-based Tate and Lyle sugar firm under its Jamaican subsidiary, the West Indies Sugar Company acquired the Frome Sugar Estate as part of 16 estates and six factories in Westmoreland and Hanover. The small factories were closed and a central factory began construction at Frome in early 1938. From the beginning, the West Indies Sugar Company had placed itself head and shoulders above its competition in showing progress in the treatment of its workers such as the construction of several cottages for housing and plans for the provision of medical services. It began upgrading estate infrastructure and expanding the acreage under sugar cultivation. And this witnessed an increase in employment between November 1937 and the eve of the unrest in April 1938. In spite of these efforts, however, the conditions under which workers operated were still less than ideal. The wages remained substandard, and the living accommodations for many consisted of nothing more than burlap bag hammocks strung up in open sheds or sleeping on the ground in open air exposed to the elements. The proverbial camel's back was broken in the late afternoon of April 29 at the estate's pay office when many construction workers failed to receive their weekly wages, and for some, a reduction in those same said wages for which they received neither prior warning nor any satisfactory explanation. Furthermore, the white pay clerk's attitude was considered high-handed in the matter, and it was too much to bear. So the worker smashed a window of the pay office and after being met with defensive shots, battered the building with stone sticks, machetes, and clubs. The police were called in and the situation quieted. However, the workers were not done as their concerns were still not addressed. The following day, the pay clerk was terrorized and had to leave the property under police protection. By this time, the majority of the estate's workers, an estimated 1,000, many shouting that they were willing to die on the spot unless their calls for four shillings or a dollar a day were immediately met, were involved in the unrest. The roads leading to the factory were blocked and rioters tore up estate documents, held up vehicles, looted sugar from both the factory and a passing truck from a neighboring estate. Not only did the workers want a wage increase and improved living accommodations, they also wanted the removal of the pay clerk, who was an embodiment of the domineering and overbearing disregard with which they were treated by their white employers. Other grievances include the taxing work schedule and like Barbados, the mechanization of the estate, which threatened many jobs and the lack of genuine labor leaders and organization among the people. The disturbance grew to such critical levels that police reinforcements were called in and prevented the crowd from causing destruction on nearby estates. On Monday, the boiling point was reached when the police descended on the crowd to disperse it and four people were killed, several wounded and many arrested. The immediate result of the unrest was an increase in wages for the estate's construction workers, as well as a reduction in the length of the work day and an extended lunch hour. And in solidarity with Rome, demonstration under the leadership of William Grant in Kingston expressed anger, resentment, and disappointment with the state of affairs affecting the Black laboring class in the island. And in a bid to prevent a recurrence of the Frome incident, officials quickly moved to address their concerns and plans were made for the provision of work for the city's unemployed. But the flame had been lit in Frome 
and by the end of May and early June, labor disturbances resulting in looting, property destruction, injuries, and fatalities occurred throughout the island. These were only quelled by the involvement of labor activists, Alexander Bustamante, Norman Manley, William Grant, and Alan Coombs, and the resolutions of some of these issues facing the workers, including the provision of land for the landless and the setup of a board of conciliation to arbitrate disputes between employers and employees. Alan Coombs, one of the labor activists, he formed the Jamaica Workmen and Tradesmen Union in 1936, but he lacked the organizational experience and resources to expand the trade union. As such, he invited Bustamante, a moneylender and avid public supporter for the cause of labor to join his team. But it was Bustamante that stood out at the end of the 1938 rebellion. For members of the working class, the fact that Bustamante, a light-skinned man of mixed racial heritage, standing up to fight for them cemented his position as a labor martyr and champion for the underdog. And the Bustamante Industrial Trade Union, Trade Union was formed in direct response to the 1938 rebellion. But Bustamante's larger-than-life presence on the labor scene was facilitated by William Grant's reluctance to assume leadership of the movement. Grant, who was a Black nationalist and a Garveyite, was also an advocate for workers' rights and held regular meetings in Kingston's parks. As a man of their own shade and station in life who could identify with them, he held the following of Kingston's working class. But Grant believed that a black man would not be taken seriously by the colonial government. Although Bustamante had been publicized in the plight of the poor in the Jamaican and British press prior to this, he did not have that widespread rapport with the masses. It was Grant's encouragement which placed him firmly on the people's platform. Norman Manley first entered the scene as a mediator for the strike in wharf workers following Bustamante's and Grant's arrest during the Kingston demonstration. Although initially shying away from the title of labor leader, Manley worked together with Bustamante to alleviate the tensions in the troubled areas in the immediate aftermath of the riots. And the People's National Party was formed in direct response to the labor rebellion. So not to be outdone, some notable women who assisted the cause of labor in Jamaica include Aggie Bernard, Edna Manley, and Adina Spencer. And they all assisted the, 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 the striking um, waterfront workers in Kingston by washing and cooking for them or raising money to, uh, to feed them. Now, the culmination of the 1930s protests throughout the region resulted in the appointment of the West India Royal Commission in mid-1938 to seek solutions to the problems facing the vast majority of people in the British West Indies. As the Second World War erupted the following year, the findings of the commission were shelved until the war ended in 1945, out of fear that it could be used for German propaganda during the conflict. The findings publicly acknowledged and revealed the appalling state of the working class in the colonies. Among other things, it pointed to the inadequacies in living standards and in the labor relationship between employers and employees. In this latter regard, it identified the need for collective labor agreements to safeguard the interests of workers. Furthermore, it recommended the expansion of the franchise to include the masses and that the territories federate in order to alleviate the problems confronting them. The former was fulfilled beginning in 1944 when systematic movements towards self-autonomy for the territories commenced with Jamaica being the first to be granted a fully representative constitution with universal adult suffrage. And the latter suggestion was fulfilled between 1958 and 1962 with the West Indies Federation of 10 island colonies, which was designed to allow them to become independent as one nation. When the federal experiment failed, Jamaica became the first British West Indian Territory to be granted independence, accomplishing this in 1962. It could be argued then 
that the overarching result of the 1930s labor rebellions was to persuade Britain to end colonialism in the British West Indies. Within the West Indies itself, though, the protests created an embryonic self-confidence in the laborers, persuading them of the power they could wield with joint action. Their unorganized movement created the room for the emergence of labor and political leaders who came in and facilitated the process, forever changing the landscape by ushering in self-government and independence. So then, to recap, what were the causes of the 1930s labor rebellions? They include economic. And this would be unemployment and irregular employment, low wages, high taxes, lack of effective labor representation, the Great Depression. Political causes, lack of effective political representation for the masses. Social causes, that would be poverty. And as we have seen, the underlying cause for all of these was the disregard with which the white elite treated the non-white masses. What were the consequences of the labor rebellions? They include improved wages, improved working conditions, formation and legalizing of trade unions, formation, uh, formation of political parties, and movement towards adult suffrage, self-government, and independence. And that brings us to the end of this lecture. We will have a short break, and then we will meet back at 10 a.m. for a short marketing presentation, moving forward with history. Our next and final session for today, Crown Colony Government, begins at 10.30. And remember, if you're unable to join us on Zoom, we are streaming live on our YouTube channel, History UE Mona. Thank you.
Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm glad you could make it. My name is Dr. Julian Cresser. I am a lecturer in the Department of History and Archaeology, um, and I'm here today to talk to you a bit about moving forward with history. Um, I know as someone who did history at university, I got the question numerous times. So what is it that you intend to do with history when you graduate? Teach? And I'm sure that that is a question that many of you face, maybe not in those exact same words, but a lot of people, you know, are concerned about doing a history degree because they wonder how they're going to make a career out of it. I've come across many people in the last two decades that have been um, at the University of the West Indies, come across many people who have said to me, boy, sir, I love history but I came to you to do something else because I couldn't see myself making a career out of history. And I want to address that today. And I have a presentation entitled Moving Forward with History. And I'd just like to take a few minutes to explain what exactly we mean by moving forward with history. The first thing that I'd like to ask people is how many of you are familiar with sites like Upwork or Fiverr? Right now, we find ourselves in a new paradigm, a paradigm that had started to emerge even before the COVID pandemic, but one which has certainly been accelerated in the last two years because of the circumstances surrounding COVID-19. We live in a world in which there are so many more remote and virtual opportunities available to us. We really are seeing in many ways the kind of you know, heights of globalization, interconnectedness, the possibility of connecting with all parts of the world. And this opens up, as I said, many new opportunities for us. Sites like Upwork and Fiverr are meant to capitalize on those things. You can be sitting here in Jamaica and working for clients in Asia, in North America, in Africa. And that means different types of opportunities for people with history skills. I went into Upwork and I just did a search of history to see, you know, people who list history as one of their, their, their skills, um, their skill sets. Um, these are just two very quick examples of some of the, that I've, of some of the people that I've found. Um, here's one, Joseph, who writes content specializing in history and education, and his going rate on Upwork is $50 US an hour. That works out to what, roughly about 7,600 Jamaican dollars an hour. Um, you know, you work 10 hours a week, that's $75,000 a week, that's $300,000 Jamaican a month working 10 hours a week, um, writing articles. Another person I found, similar rate, $45 an hour, has a bachelor's degree, just a bachelor's degree in archaeology and ancient history. And they write content specifically for social media websites. So it's digital content. And you look on the skills and you'll notice that this person here pairs history with other skill sets, um, GIS mapping, digital marketing. So she lists as one of her skill sets, you know, writing for social media and websites. So there are these possibilities now in what are ways in which someone trained in history can translate both a knowledge of history, but also certain skill sets, writing, analysis, um, you know, critical thinking, how, how that can be translated into opportunities to make money. And we live in a world in which, as Bill Gates said, content is king. Content is one of the most consumed and sold products in the world today. All of us, I'm sure, spend lots of time um, on the internet, on social media. And what we're doing is consuming content, content that has to be produced and production that has to be paid for. So moving forward with him first and foremost, moving forward with how we think about history, how we think about careers in history, how we think about the skill sets that can be paired with history and what can be done with these skill sets. Obviously, there are many ways in which content can be created, produced, shared in this new paradigm that we're in. Um, I don't know how many of you watch a lot of Netflix series, other um, content from streaming sites. 
some of the more popular series that you'll find on Netflix do have historical content. Um, uh, there's Vikings, I've never watched a second of it, but I heard that it was popular. I see people all around me now talking about Bridgerton, um, you know, as a current series that gets a lot of attention. Now, these shows that are based on past periods, bringing historical consultants to work and help to produce the content. And there are thousands more examples of shows like this. Um, historical dramas are very popular in parts of Asia. Uh, Korean dramas, Indian dramas, Japanese dramas, you know, are incredibly popular form of content that is being produced and consumed. Um, I don't know how many of you are interested in things like anime, for instance, but I do know that um, not only amongst children, but amongst uh, many adults, anime is very popular. Um, you may be familiar with Tanya, um, the evil, but you may not necessarily know that a lot of the content in this anime is really speaking to the events surrounding World War II. And again, historical consultants are brought in to help to produce the content for these series. Um, a lot of anime surrounds the Edo period in Japanese history. Um, samurais are, you know, a very popular kind of theme and trope in a lot of this anime. And again, knowledge to create these shows around these themes requires historians to come in and participate. So there's that kind of outlet for the creation of content that is based on history. Um, you know, podcasts are something else that are, you know, that, that is becoming very popular. There are many um, very popular history podcasts, some of which started very small, an audience of a dozen people, but over time, the content that was produced was engaging and interesting um, because people are interested in history. People are curious about the past. Um, people want to learn from it. And so these podcasts, once they were of good production, were interesting and engaging, grew and grew and grew. And many of them now have, you know, regular audiences, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Um, you know, maybe some of the top ones, even millions of regular listeners. And this is also a way in which historical content is being produced and shared and monetized. Because when these podcasts get popular, there are ways in which they can be monetized. Similarly, people produce content for YouTube, um, there are many possibilities about the monetization of historical content through those types of channels. Um, what it, of course, requires is now the pairing of historical knowledge and skills with other types of skill sets in production. But there are many types of opportunities for these synergies in the world of, of history and archaeology and heritage now. Um, you know, there are many careers out there that perhaps you've never heard of or even thought of that pair the new digital technologies that we have with applications within fields of history, archaeology, and heritage. Some of you may have gone on our website and seen 3D reconstructions of a site or uh, 3D reconstructions of an object. Maybe you're shopping on Amazon and there's a product that allows you to, to do a 360 degree view. The process by which this is created is called photogrammetry. And it is something that is being employed more and more and more in the fields of archaeology. Many museums, um, heritage institutions have objects in their collections, and they want to be able to share these objects with audiences all over the world. Audiences that can't come in in person, especially, you know, as we've seen with the conditions of the pandemic. And so these types of digital reproductions enable this wider sharing and accessibility. But it requires people with these skill sets. So the photogrammetrist is somebody who is trained in photography and in um, 3D reconstruction software. And then they pair that with their archaeological knowledge. And here's a career. And it is something that's very different. It can be incredibly exciting and engaging. Um, and allow you to connect with audiences in ways that maybe we didn't before in the fields of history and archaeology. So we are moving forward in that sense. And the Department of History and Archaeology is moving forward in how we then train our graduates and prepare our graduates for these opportunities. We have introduced a course, for instance, called Digital History, which specifically 
exposes and trains students in digital technologies and shows the ways in which these digital technologies can be matched with historical knowledge for the production of new types of content that can engage audiences in new ways. Moving forward with history also means something else. When we have our introduction to history at the beginning of your degree, one of the things that we stress in terms of the importance of history is how much a knowledge of the past helps us to explain the present that we're in and provides guidance for our future plans. It really is very difficult, if not impossible, for us in our everyday lives to move forward without knowledge from the past. So moving forward with history is also a nod to the fact that many different institutions, many different jobs, many different sectors need historical knowledge in order to move forward. What that means is that historical knowledge will always be relevant. History as a discipline, as the discipline that produces this knowledge is always going to be relevant. Anytime there is something that's happening in current affairs, you turn on CNN, you turn on MSNBC, Al Jazeera, whatever it is, there's a present crisis. There's you know, a present event. Who do they bring in? Historians who can provide the type of context that is necessary for us to understand what is going on. So there's always going to be this need for history. What we have to recognize is that the new graduate of the University of the West Indies Department of History and Archaeology may not necessarily be entering a traditional field as a history teacher or an academic historian, but is looking to take this knowledge of history and pair it with other skill sets in order to make themselves relevant. And we have adapted in many ways to that. As I said, we have new courses that match up history with other skills like audiovisual history and heritage. Um, I mentioned digital history a while ago in which um, students work with different digital technologies and ultimately build um, a history-based website of their own. So you have that training in, in, in the employment of digital technologies with history. But we also have degree programs which allow students to get a training in history as well as get a training in history in association with other fields that might be relevant pairings. So you can come to our department, do a bachelor's degree in history. You can do a bachelor's in history and archaeology. And as I see this slide, this slide here, I'm reminded of the fact that I you know, went to university with somebody who did biology, but had an interest in scuba diving, took on that interest, and then ultimately paired that interest in scuba diving with their biology and became you know, one of Jamaica's and the Caribbean's you know, foremost marine biologists. What is happening now is that there is a growth in the interest in marine archaeology. And again, if we think creatively, if we think about this new paradigm that we're in, if we open our mind and think outside the box of history means I'm going to end up teaching or working as a researcher, we will recognize that there are many possible opportunities out there for the use of historical knowledge and skills to you know, engage with audiences in new ways, discover knowledge in new ways, um, and have potentially exciting careers. Um, in addition, we have a degree in, in history and journalism. Um, as I mentioned a while ago, anytime there are these events and there's the need for context, it is very often the historian who is drawn upon. Well, we recognize this and we partnered with the Caribbean Institute of, of Media for, for the production of a degree in history and journalism. So you come, you learn journalism skills, you learn broadcasting of various forms, as well as you do history courses so that when you leave the university, if your interest is going to journalism, you have that cutting edge, that advantage over your peers in that you can say to potential broadcasters, not only do I have these skills in journalism and investigation, 
but I also have a wide historical knowledge that already provides me with a lot of context for the things that I'll be exploring. And that gives you a significant competitive advantage. Similarly, we have a BA in history and international relations. International relations is also a field that benefits greatly from history. You could be working in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and your minister has you know, a meeting with a diplomat um, from Cuba, from Rwanda. You know, just, just this week, um, Rwanda's head of state has visited us and there's a need for background. I don't want to say something insensitive. Um, I need to be informed in terms of, you know, the history of our relations. It is the historian who is then drawn upon to come and provide this guidance, provide this context, even prepare speeches, talking points that help these delegates when they're negotiating, when they're engaging in diplomatic relations, when they're presenting at the United Nations um, international conferences. So we recognize this in the history department. We recognize that many of these fields, politics, international relations, cannot move forward without history. Um, just out of curiosity, I did a search um, on politicians with history degrees and two of the most powerful heads of state in the world, um, or heads of government, really. Joe Biden of the US and Boris Johnson of the UK, both are history graduates. They both did a history major. So again, this is something that is a stepping stone for entry into many different fields because there are so many fields that cannot go forward without the type of knowledge and skills that history provides. So I'm saying all of this to say that we here in the Department of History and Archaeology are moving forward with history. We are moving forward with courses that we've designed, we're moving forward with bachelor's programs that we have created, which recognize a new space in which we're living in and operating in, which recognizes the new opportunities that are out there. And we want to prepare graduates to take advantage of those opportunities, to think differently about what can be done with history and to move forward in that way. But we are also in the department recognizing that nothing really can move forward without a knowledge of the past. And so we are going to continue to research, disseminate, teach and share that knowledge of the past and prepare graduates who can take that context, that knowledge into many different fields and help society to continue to move forward. So all of this to say that uh, sorry, you can also do a, a minor in history. If, again, you want to be a sociologist, if you want to, you know, get into economics, any other field, and still feel that historical knowledge is going to be useful to you, then there's also the option of doing a minor in history. So all of this to say to you that if you have an interest in history, if you have a love of history, there's no need for you to be one of those persons three or five years from now who says, boy, I love history, but I came to UA to do something else because I couldn't see a, his, a career in history. If you love history, there are many, many, many ways in which you can turn that love and interest into an interesting, engaging, and profitable career. So think about that and we love for you to come and move forward with us. So thank you very much for your time, um, for listening, and hope to see you in a few years' time, graduating from our department. Thank you very much.
We continue with the second and last session today. Our presenter for this session is Ms. Jeanette Corniff, and she will be speaking on Crown Colony Government. Ms. Corniff, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another CSEC lecture in this 2022 series. As mentioned, I will be speaking on Crown Colony Government. And this is significant in the history of the English speaking Caribbean. A significant question has to do with the issues surrounding the adoption of Crown Colony Government in the English Caribbean in the 19th century. And interestingly, we see here the 19th century, we do not see post-1865. And this is interesting. And I hope that as we go along, you will pick up on this. And if it is something that you were not previously exposed to, that you will gain an appreciation for this element of British Caribbean history. If it is something that you were previously exposed to as you prepared for your exam, that some new information will be introduced to you. Crown Colony government was also known as responsible government, but I have a question mark here because not everyone is of the view that it was in fact responsible government. It was also known as a paternalistic form of government, a form of government in which the interest of the underprivileged would have been taken into account, but was this really so? Let us get into the meat of the matter. But in order to get into the meat of the matter, we will have to go a bit further back in history. We will look at the period before 1838. We will look at the period immediately following the Morandi Rebellion, and then take a brief look at some developments in the latter part of the 19th century with regards to Crown Colony government. Speaking about government, hmm, governing in the English speaking Caribbean, when did this commence? Interestingly, we are aware that the English started to settle in the Caribbean region in 1623. In this year, Sir Thomas Warner and a small group of men landed in St. Kitts. St. Kitts is formerly known as St. Cristobal. And they entered this territory after receiving a royal patent from King James I to colonize the Leeward Islands. The Kalinagos were still in this territory. And therefore, what Sir Thomas Warner did was to make peace with the Kalinago chief in this region. It's interesting to note that St. Kitts, a territory that was in the earlier periods shared by the French and the British, had a few Frenchmen in the territory at the time when Sir Thomas Warner entered. This essentially, this 1623 settlement in St. Kitts was the beginning of English settlement in the Caribbean region. Very, very important because even Barbados, which became the early leader with regards to the development of a plantation colony was settled after St. Kitts. What is also important to note is that the type of government that was established in this territory and in several of the other early English speaking Caribbean territories was the proprietary system of government. So we are essentially talking about the Lord Proprietorship System. Here, merchants organized trading and plantation companies that were chartered by government and granted specific privileges. These trading companies received monopoly rights in a particular trade and a specific territory. Essentially, we're talking about Britain. She did not have the time to invest the necessary resources in settling many of these early territories with no firm hope that they would actually have garnered success here. So private companies applied for the right to go out and conquer some of these territories. 
And having done that, they were given charge of these territories for quite some time before the crown came in and took over. These plantation companies were granted the privilege to divide land, administer justice, tax the settlers, etc. The principal merchant of the syndicate was known as the Lord Proprietor. This individual was the most important person on the ground. He had exclusive monopoly for the exploitation and settlement of the islands. He paid a certain percentage of the revenue from the settlement to the crown. And the Lord Proprietor was responsible for the defense of the territory on behalf of the crown. These companies were as much military as they were political and commercial in their operations. Essentially, the proprietary system of government was replicated in many of the early English territories. I want to note, however, that this type of government was not attempted in Jamaica. Initially, Jamaica had a military government, so it was ruled militarily before the advance towards a civilian government. And uh, I, I want to say also that with regards to these territories, primarily those in the, well, those in the, in the Leeward and Windward Islands, where the proprietary form of government was in effect, eventually civilian government was introduced by the Crown. When this happened, it was the old representative system of government that was introduced. What was the old representative system of government that later gave way to Crown Colony in many of these territories? Under this system, there was the governor. He represented the ruling monarch. And he was entitled to the obedience of all civil and military officials. In addition to the governor, there was a council, a legislative council, and members of this council were selected by the governor. So essentially, he would select persons who were of a similar mind with regards to the administration of the colony. And then there was the assembly. These members were not selected as were the members of the council, but they were elected. They were elected from among the population. And as we proceed, I hope you, one of the things you will realize is that it was this body, the assembly, that was considered most problematic for officials at the colonial office, especially. By virtue of having that assembly, individuals, merchants, planters, etc., who settled in these territories had a say in government. So it was not autocratic rule from the motherland via the colonial office, which was responsible for the administration of these colonies. So over time, there were clashes between officials at the colonial office who represented the crown and members of the assembly. Over time, other Caribbean territories were taken from the Spaniards or were taken from other European territories such as the French, which had taken territory from the Spaniards. And by the early 19th century, there was a thrust away from this type of government towards one by which the crown via the colonial office would have a greater say or a firmer hand in the administration of these colonies. So essentially, from Lord proprietorship to the old representative system of government. But after a while, there was this desire to move away from the old representative system of government. Crown colony government was therefore introduced in the British Caribbean in the early 19th century. This was done in some of the newly acquired territories. For example, Trinidad. It was seen as a way for the crown to correct some of the perceived ills of the old representative system of government 
in which members of the white oligarchy often defied imperial rule in their own interest. The members of this white oligarchy were members of the assembly in the various Caribbean territories. So can we say that this represented a fresh start? Were they trying to introduce a new culture? Were they trying to weed out the bad eggs? Well, later in the post-emancipation period, specifically in 1866, the year following the Moran Bay Rebellion, Crown Colony government was introduced on a wider scale as a result of several factors. Essentially, there was dissatisfaction with the old representative system, many conflicting interests. We can look at the pre-1838 period and see the hand of colonial office officials attempting to birth change, and in fact they did, due to the challenges that they had with the assemblies in some of the older settled territories. So as a result of the Napoleonic Wars, Britain gained more territories in the Caribbean region and attempted a fresh thing, a new thing, not wanting to repeat some of the mistakes that they thought they made as a result of some of the effects that they had to deal with, effects of the old representative system of government. So that's for the pre-1838 period. But then there were some issues that became very obvious in the post-1838 period, primarily round about the middle of the century. So there were, for example, fears associated with black ascendancy in government. And in this regard, we'll use the case of Jamaica. There was also the view that the old representative system of government was not representative of the non-white population. With regards to these two views related to the post-1838 period, the whites in particular and some coloreds had a problem with the old representative system of government because they thought it did not work in their favor enough. It was too open to non-whites gaining a seat in the parish vestries and on the island assembly. With regards to the second point, we see where the whites were not the ones who had a challenge here, at least not those who were members of the island assemblies or assemblies in non-island English speaking Caribbean territories. But there were some other individuals, for example, officials out of the colonial office who felt like the old representative system of government gave too much of a say to the members of the white oligarchy. It affected those officials negatively and they were also of the opinion that it affected the non-white population negatively. And with regards to the non-white population, the blacks, most of them previously enslaved, made up the majority. In the middle years of the 19th century, a crown colony was one which, not having a representative assembly, was a sphere for legislation by the king in council. There, an, there, there, an order in council was as binding as an act of parliament. This is a system of British colonial administration under which Britain retained control over defense, foreign affairs, internal security, and various administrative and budget matters. The system of Crown Colony government was designed to prevent a strong political life or opposition to the British governor and his officials. The governor was the representative of the Crown in each one of these English speaking Caribbean territories and often was at loggerheads with members of the assembly. The body that was elected and not selected by him. Now as a British colony conquered from a foreign power, 
Trinidad's constitution and political history was rather different from the older British colonies like Barbados and Jamaica. At first, between 1802 and 31, the governor representing the British crown had virtually unlimited powers with a council of advice which lacked lawmaking powers. From 1832, however, the island was governed under what became known as Crown Colony Government, a legislative council with the lawmaking powers, but no elected members, therefore no assembly, only officials and unofficials chosen by the governor. This was an interesting development. So Trinidad here is a very good example of a colony in which Crown colony rule was established prior to 1838. One of the newer territories, the officials at the colonial office and those in England who they represented, in Britain who they represented, paid serious attention to governance in Trinidad. And clearly they were satisfied enough with what they saw that they decided that they wanted to replicate this in other English speaking Caribbean territories. And they did try. Essentially, this was a new experiment in colonial government, which was autocratic in nature. Noted colonial office official Sir Henry Taylor believed that an extension in this type of government to all the West Indian colonies was the true solution for the, problem, for the problem of recalcitrant administrations in the colonies. Essentially, they were accused of being stubborn. One example of this recalcitrant nature of the colonial governments was the delay of the Jamaican government in accepting and introducing the dictates of the amelioration bill and the half-hearted way in which it was eventually introduced they were pressured into accepting the amelioration bill and even so they did not take on all of it. This relates to another topic, but this further brought pressure on them from the anti-slavery groups in Britain who realized that, okay, so I guess you are not willing to meet us halfway because some of these groups were in favor of gradual emancipation some were only in favor of ameliorated conditions for the enslaved, but not emancipation. But many became hardened after they realized that the planters, the merchants, the members of the white oligarchy in these territories, Jamaica being an example, were being very stubborn and self-centered. Sir Henry Taylor, who for some time supervised the West Indian affairs at the colonial office, was in favor of the abandonment of the old representative system of government during this period. By way of information that we will discuss later, he was also quite instrumental in the abandonment of the system in 1866. He played a key role in the decision of Jamaica abandoning the old representative system of government after the Moran Bay Rebellion and accepting Crown Colony government as an alternative. But even before emancipation, Taylor was in favor of overhauling the colonial systems which were largely controlled by absentee planters and which proved difficult to govern because of the stubborn way in which they sought to promote and reserve their interest, even if they had to defy authority. He therefore played a role in the crisis of 1839, when he attempted to sweep away the whole assembly system. Clearly, this attempt failed. Or was it just delayed? Sir Henry Taylor later hurriedly drafted the, mem the memorandum which strengthened Governor Eyre's position and forced the assembly in Jamaica to basically abolish itself. When we consider other territories in the Caribbean region, Barbados, Grenada, Tobago, these 
territories actually retain the old form of government with their assemblies intact, much to the displeasure of Taylor who hoped to see them fall in line. Eventually, Barbados was the only one to retain the system. When Tobago, became a part of what we now know as Trinidad and Tobago in the 1890s, they were basically forced to accept crown colony rule because Trinidad from the early 1800s was a crown colony. So she basically lost her separate legislature and came under the same regime. Essentially, Taylor believed that the crown is the only possible representative of the people. And that's interesting, the only possible representative of the people. Which people was Henry Taylor talking about? Was Henry Taylor referring to the white oligarchy who, to a significant extent, were contented with the system, especially before emancipation? Was he talking about this same group of persons who post-emancipation still wanted to maintain their political privileges while ensuring that non-whites did not ascend in this regard? What was Henry Taylor talking about? Was he possibly talking about the black masses throughout the English speaking Caribbean? Was Henry Taylor being himself selfish in wanting to promote what he and others at the colonial office thought was the best option? These are questions for you to consider. From the perspective of the crown, the new form of government would be both efficient and impartial it would presumably provide the buffer between contending factions, classes, and interests. It would also presum presumably be able to remove the most blatant causes of distress among the masses while protecting and advancing the interest of the oligarchy. According to Patrick Bryan, therefore, what Henry Taylor was advocating was in the best interest of the black masses advocating this on behalf of the crown that many of the blacks saw as being paternalistic from 1838. Many in fact thought that Mrs. Queen was so kind to have granted them their freedom. So even though for the period from 1837 to 1901, there was a female monarch in Britain, they still thought about rule from the crown in a paternalistic way. Essentially the whole issue of crown colony being responsible government had to do with balancing the interests of the various classes of the various groups within society. And because it was deemed to be better able to do this, Individuals such as Henry Taylor, even before emancipation, were in favor of wide scale acceptance of Crown colony government. But what about fear associated with the rise of non whites in politics? Let's look at the example of Jamaica. During slavery, Political rights was the preserve of the property white class. Free blacks, coloreds and Jews were barred from politics because of their color and religion. Jews were whites or white, referred to as whites, but they were discriminated against because of their religion. Britain was a Protestant society. And of course, the non-whites, blacks and coloreds, 
that was because of their color. As emancipation approached, and we're talking about from about 1831, these groups were given full civil liberties in the hope that they would form an alliance with the whites against the soon to be emancipated black masses, thereby ensuring political power in the hands of a few. This is interesting because for many decades, free coloreds, free blacks, Jews were robbed of certain civil liberties. They could not hold certain government positions. So they could not work in certain areas of the civil service. They could not participate in certain areas of the plantation economy. They could not inherit property in the case of non-whites. They could not inherit property beyond a certain value in Jamaica in particular based on a 1761 inheritance law. However, as the fans that were encouraging the flames of emancipation became more obvious during the early 1830s, the white leadership in Jamaica decided that it was a good idea to give these persons some of the rights that they had previously taken away from them, especially in the case of the free coloreds, when their numbers started to exceed that of the whites in the population. So they did this with a selfish motive in mind. After 1838, the political franchise continued to be restricted, both by gender and property qualifications. After 1838, previously enslaved Blacks and Coloreds were able to vote once they met the qualifications for voting. We're talking about males. Females were not allowed to vote. To be able to vote, a man had to have one of the following. One, ownership and pay taxes on a freehold valued at least valued at at least six pounds payment of a rent charge of 30 pounds annually payment of direct taxes of at least three pounds in all cases one was required to register his name on the voters list in this case literacy therefore became an issue for many because the majority the vast majority of the freed population was still illiterate. To stand for election in the parish vestry, local government, one had to meet the requirements to vote. However, qualification for standing for election to the assembly, central government was higher. A candidate, or a potential candidate had to meet the following qualifications. Have a minimum income of 180 pounds from land or the ownership of real property worth at least 1,800 pounds or both real and personal property worth 3,000 pounds or the payment of not less than 10 pounds annually in direct taxes. Most of the newly emancipated people clearly did not meet these qualifications. Interestingly though, it did not stop many of them from being involved in politics. If you think about politics in the 2022 20, context, or let me just say in the 20th context, since we haven't had much activity since 2022 in this regard. If you think about politics, think about when there or the various political parties have campaigns. Even persons who are not registered to vote, either because they choose not to, or they are too young, they participate in mass rallies. They participate in canvassing. They can do this if they want to, even if they don't have a vote. Freed people 
after emancipation were aware of this too. So beginning with that first election in 1944, they made their voices heard in various regards. Two significant ways in which they participated in the political process are one, they ensured that they put themselves up as candidates for the parish registries. Two, they, they ensured that they qualified to vote. So with the assistance of missionaries, for example, they were able to purchase spots of land and they paid taxes on these lands. So they were able to vote. I also want to mention that even though this was not as popular, especially in the case of blacks, some non-whites also gained a seat in the assembly. Brown men, mostly those who had never been enslaved, were elected to the assembly during this period. One such person, Robert Osborne. In fact, by 1852, 36% of the assembly was made up of men of African ancestry, the vast majority being coloreds. Two black men, however, also became assemblymen before the abolition of the assembly in 1866. With regards to vestry politics, and again, this is local government, between 1838 and 1865, 60, 6 0, 60 black men, which included former enslaved people, won seats to the parish vestries. So think about your councillors, those who serve at the local government level. So an increasing number of blacks, many of them who were previously enslaved, were becoming vestrymen or in the 2020 context, they would have been counselors. That was a significant development, a significant development that drove fear into members of the white oligarchy and even some colleagues who supported that segment of the society more than they supported other colleagues or blacks. The two black men who made it into the assembly before 1865 were Edward Vickers and Charles Price. Their election reflected some of the important social changes that had taken place in Jamaica in the decades following the abolition of slavery, since they were voted in primarily as a result of the overwhelming support of former enslaved people who qualified to vote. According to Swithin Wilmoth, the Blacks saw the privilege to vote as an important badge of freedom and the surest way to promote their own interests. And in 1847 and 1849 respectively, Edward Vickers and Charles Price, who were members of Kingston's free black population during slavery, were elected to the Jamaican assembly, becoming the only two blacks to sit there before the assembly was abolished in 1865. Both enjoyed electoral successes in rural constituencies where freedmen had established new settlements that represented significant social changes in the Jamaican countryside. In other elections to the assembly by the early 1850s, the new class of black voters also endorsed colored Jewish and white candidates who promoted their interests and courted their support. We're talking about Jews in the parish of St. Catherine. We're talking about Jews in the parish of Trelawney. They, along with members of the free colored population prior to emancipation, were severely limited with regards to their political and economic advancement by the whites. And so many were not tricked in, in early 1831, when the whites gave them full civil liberties, they remembered that the whites, non-Jewish whites that is, because Jews of course were white, did not have their best interest at heart. And so while some 
would have sided with white candidates. There were some Jews who sided with colored candidates and black candidates and also received the support of some coloreds and blacks as they put themselves up for election. So it's important to note that we're not just talking about pol the political advancement of non-whites. We're also, I'm also injecting here the fact that Jews who were whites also got the opportunity to advance themselves politically during this 1838 to 1865 period. Let's talk a little bit more about Edward Vickers and Charles Price. Both were born free. Vickers, he was a landlord and a shopkeeper in St. Andrew. Charles Price was a builder. In 1847, Edward Vickers, a Kingston landlord and liquor retailer in St. Andrew, who had deep roots in Kingston's small free black community during slavery, won one of the three assembly seats for the parish of St. Catherine, which included the political capital of Spanish town where the governor resided and the assembly was located. This was a massive development, a massive development. The seat of government for the country was located in Spanish town, the then capital of Jamaica. And a black man was the representative to the assembly for Spanish town. Yes, that was so. And his slogan was simple. Vote for Vickers, the black man. Vote for Vickers, the black man. He needed to say nothing more to gain the support of many blacks and coloreds who became enfranchised during the period. Wilmot notes that on the day of the historical on the day of the historic election, this was the 23rd of October, 1847, Edward Vickers emphatically defeated Dr. Palmer, polling 99 votes to his opponents, 43 votes, becoming the first black man to sit in the hollowed halls of the Jamaican assembly. While Edward Vickers benefited from the support of colored artisans, Jewish retailers, such as Jacob Delapena and the white teacher and curate, it was the Blacks' solid support that undergirded his historic victory. Price won a seat in the assembly in 1849 and he served until 1863, representing the parish of St. John. This is now in West Central St. Catherine. And you'll see that here on the map. One of the developments that occurred in the aftermath of the Moran Bay Rebellion is that the number of parishes in Jamaica was reduced from 22 to 14. What we now know as St. Catherine takes in the form of St. Thomas in the Vale, St. John and St. Dorothy. So it was within this section here that Charles Price got his support. His support came from former enslaved people who had settled in villages such as Content, Koja Hill, Fellowship Hall, Friendship, Wanderbolas, Watermount, etc. I'm not sure if there's anyone who is listening and you are from one of these communities. Individuals who lived in these communities before you helped to make history helped to make Jamaican political history. Both Vickers and Price supported measures that provided for more funds for education reform of the penal codes and more equitable taxation, issues which were important to the masses. Wilmot further states, this groundbreaking political shift in the parish and country followed up on earlier changes in the racial composition of the assembly post-emancipation. In St. Catherine, as early as 1837, 
general election, the colored and Jewish voters in Spanish town elected William Thomas March, a colored solicitor and Jacob Sanguinetti, a Jewish merchant to two of the three seats. And until 1841, the three social groups, whites, coloreds and Jews shared the representation of the parish. By 1841, the white political representatives at the highest level in the parish were displaced and St. Catherine was represented by two coloreds along with the Jew sanguinity. I want to speak briefly of George William Gordon, who was born a slave and was freed as a child by his father. He, of course, is one of our national heroes. In 1863, he won a seat in the assembly representing the parish of St. Thomas in the East, the most easterly parish you'll see on this map. He was significantly supported by small black settlers in the parish, colored artisans, shopkeepers, etc. in and around Morant Bay were influenced by Paul Bogle in supporting George William Gordon. With regards to Vestra politics in 1857, nine of the 10 elected Vestramen in St. David, another former Eastern parish, which is now a part of St. Thomas, were black artisans with at least six being former enslaved people. In that parish in 1850, five black men were elected to the vestry. These were significant political developments that alarmed some white members of the society, especially, but also some coloreds who did not want to see blacks dominate the politics of the country. In the 1853 elections, 10 black artisans, six of whom had been enslaved, captured all the seats for vestrymen, replacing all the incumbents. This success of the black freeholders in St. David in 1857 had alarmed the governor who warned against the extension of the franchise since, quote, candidates of European extraction were already losing influence in the vestries. Additionally, in Portland by 1853, black artisans from Port Antonio and Maroons from Morton accounted for seven of the 10 seats on the Portland vestry. By 1854, Blacks established a presence on the St. Andrew Parish Vestry with the election of William Ruggles, William Ruggles Thomas, a baker and chase maker. And then by 1862, three other Blacks from Kingston, Thomas Brown, Burton Fortunatus, and Edward Thomas, a bricklayer, were elected. Interesting times indeed. By the 1850s, therefore, it was evident that the new class of Blacks, most of whom were former enslaved people, controlled the larger share of political power, maintaining their dominance until the festivities were abolished in 1866. And this is specific to those parishes uh, mentioned in the East. Very, very significant developments. And it's, it's further interesting when we consider that the Moran Bay Rebellion, it occurred in the East. It occurred in the East. Essentially by 1865, over 60 black men, many of them freedmen had won seats on the island's vestries, particularly in the Eastern parishes where the plantations had declined significantly. The local elites and the colonial office increasingly confronted by a growing politics of numbers turned to Crown Colony in 1866 after the Morant Bay Rebellion to thwart these embryonic manifestations of black politics. Now, when you consider an opinion like this from Wilmot, I hope you're wondering, so whose side were those officials at the colonial, at the colonial office on? Were they on the side of the blacks trying to ensure that they had a greater say in government? 
that government was more representative, more impartial? Was that what they were about? Or were they similarly alarmed, as many of the whites in Jamaica, that the blacks were ascending too swiftly and they could not afford for the colony to be thrust into the hands of blacks who they considered to have been inferior, not able to govern their own selves, much less a country. Essentially, there were divided opinions at the colonial office. Members of the white oligarchy did not sit by and watch blacks and coloreds ascend politically and did nothing. In 1854, an executive committee was added as another layer of government in Jamaica between the assembly and the governor. This body was made up of members of the assembly and the legislative council. They were chosen by the governor and the body was cheered by him as well. The executive committee provided a check on the decisions of the assembly whose membership was increasingly becoming to look like the mass of the people in the country. Additionally, in 1859, a new franchise regulation was passed, which included a poll tax on voters, making it more difficult for black peasant, for the members of the black peasant class to qualify to vote. These measures indicate that they realized that they had a problem and they tried to stifle out the challenge that they saw to their own political future. Here we have an image of what took place on that fateful October day in 1865 at the Morant Bay Courthouse. Of course, it spilled over to other areas of the town, other areas of the parish, etc. This looks like mayhem. But was the old representative system of government an example of partial government? Despite the political ascendancy of non-whites, the socioeconomic and political context of the outbreak of the, of the rebellion at Morant Bay reflect the view that the old representative system of government was not fair to all groups within society. Cholera and smallpox epidemics in the 1850s led to thousands of deaths, especially among the poorest. Further decline in the plantation economy with the extension of Britain's free trade policies led to further abandonment of estates, reduced employment and reduction in wages. Wages continued to be suppressed with the importation of indentured laborers. That was a key reason for their importation. In addition, the society in which Jamaicans existed at the time included this reality. High prices for imported food staples as a result of the American Civil War in the 1860s along with long periods of drought, which affected the cultivation of grown provisions. Consider the impact of these droughts, along with heavy rainfall, which led to flooding on the livelihood of the peasants. Consider the impact of this on the livelihood of those individuals who were not primarily attached to peasant plots, but worked on the estates primarily and had no work to do because the crop was destroyed. Consider how occurrences like this would have increased, would have caused an increase in the price of food. And then consider the governor of the day, Edward John Eyre, who was blamed for being 
uncaring, for causing undue misery to the bulk of the population. Growing criticism of the government for its inept response to the distress among the masses was the order of the day. Governor Eyre was particularly dismissive of the letter of criticism written and sent to the British government by the secretary of the Baptist Missionary Society, Edward Underhill, which outlined the people's hardship and suffering and the incompetence of the government. When we consider that, I want you to reflect on the political ascendancy of Blacks previously mentioned. Consider this and then think about the ways in which their political advancement was suppressed. So there were economic issues, there were social issues, there were political issues, which caused us to question the nature of this government. Was it in fact a partial government or was it an impartial government? Whose interest did this government serve? With regards to political developments, even a decade before the Moran Bay Rebellion. George William Gordon was first elected to the assembly in that year. That was a yay, a win-win moment for members of the non-white classes in society. And he advanced after that politically and was a good representative of the people of St. Thomas in the East. However, he was dismissed from political office by Governor Eyre because he had become a significant threat to the white leadership of the, of the country. He spoke out against the injustices. What would have happened if they had paid attention to what George William Gordon and other representatives of the mass of individuals in the society? What would have happened if they had paid attention to what these individuals were saying instead of allowing the situation to get to the point where all this massacre took place. Could the Moran Bay Rebellion have been avoided? We don't know. We really don't know. So due to a series of events, referred by some as a march, which turned into a riot, which turned into a rebellion, the Moran Bay Rebellion became a reality. It's a historical reality. It is said that what happened on the day was not what made it so historically significant. What I mean by that is the actions of those who were involved, primarily the Blacks, who were seen as the aggressors, but more so the way in which it was suppressed. It was harshly suppressed. This, in fact, allowed some individuals in Britain who learned of what happened to turn their minds away from the old representative form of government in favor of Crown Colony, where there was essentially direct rule from the motherland via the colonial office, via the governor in the colony. Because clearly, this was not impartial government. The government was partial. That's the opinion of some historians. Crown colony government was introduced in Jamaica in 1866 following this rebellion. A legislative council consisting of the governor, nominees of the governor and ex officio members replaced the old assembly, which had been for a long time, the political instrument of the planter class and its allies. And so 
Elections and a limited franchise gave way after 1866 to the nominating and veto powers of the governor, who was, as usual, appointed by the crown. In place of an elected assembly based upon a very narrow franchise, there had given there had powers given to, to um, the governor primarily as the representative of the crown. What we see happening here is that the power that whites and coloreds formerly had was basically taken away a nominated body became much more important. What happened to the assembly? The assembly was thrown out. It was believed that there was such a significant breakdown in the old representative system and that the Moran Bay Rebellion was the best ever example anyone could ever look for that they could not want to see anything worse than that. And therefore, it made sense to do away with this political system. There was also this fear that if left unchecked, Jamaica would have become another Haiti. This fear influenced members of the assembly to surrender their powers. Essentially, the assembly was abolished. Vestries, which formerly ran local government, were replaced by parochial boards, and the judicial system was significantly overhauled. According to Sir Henry Taylor, the insurrection was of infinite service to the colony, Jamaica. The assembly was frightened out of its life. The governor's report of his negotiations for constitutional changes in favor of the crown was received the day before the return packet was to sail. There was no time to consult the cabinet, but I was authorized to send privately to the governor the draft of such a dispatch as he was told he would probably receive by the ensuing packet in an authentic form. He learned from this draft that the crown would not accept the responsibility of legislative functions unless accompanied by the crown's paramount power in the legislative assembly. It reached him just in time to take effect upon the negotiations before the assembly recovered from the panic. And that body evicted for, evicted for the moment of the rampant pride of power so preposterously described by Sir Robert Peel 26 year, years before as, quote, a high and haughty spirit of liberty, end quote, crept into a corner and died by its own hand. Essentially, what Sir Henry Taylor failed to achieve in 1839 when he tried to abolish the assemblies. He was able to see that coming to pass in Jamaica in 1865 into 66 with several other British Caribbean territories which hadn't been crown colonies previously following. Jamaica's example. The other West Indian colonies were naturally startled by the occurrence in Jamaica and the whites moreover found themselves to be gradually losing ground in the assemblies and felt more disposed to be governed by the crown than by the black and colored people. And under Sir Benjamin Pine's skillful management and without even a suggestion from the home government, which carefully abstained from any interference, one after another of the Leeward Islands converted themselves into quasi crown colonies. Amongst the Windward Islands, St. Vincent followed, and Barbados, Grenada, and Twego are now the only West Indian islands which adhere 
to their old constitution. This was Sir Henry Taylor writing in 1871, but there were further changes after he made note of what was happening at that time or what had happened up to that point. Barbados eventually was the only English speaking Caribbean territory that retained the old form of government. As previously mentioned in the case of Tobago, when she was joined to Trinidad in the 1890s, the old representative system of government fell by the wayside and Tobago became a part of the crown colony that Trinidad and Tobago was. Grenada also followed. It was his horridly drafted memorandum referring to Sir Henry Taylor, which strengthened Governor Ayer's position and forced the assembly to a complete capitulation. And the Jamaica constitution soon became the type of crown colony government in the West Indies. Lastly, we may notice Taylor's attitude in 1871. Only Barbados, Grenada, and Tobago still had assemblies of the old type. And he hoped that they would soon adopt the new form of government. It is worth noticing that nowadays Barbados alone retains her ancient constitution, a fact of which she is immensely proud. Of course, we know that since then, Barbados became independent. And I here want to point out that whenever we are using the sources, it's very important for us to take note of when they were produced so that we do not use dated information as current information. Essentially, we have looked at the reasons for the introduction of Crown Colony government in the English Caribbean. It was highlighted that Crown Colony government was first introduced in the early 1800s or the early 19th century. Trinidad being a very good example of this introduction. It was demonstrated that colonial, offic colonial office officials, such as Sir Henry Taylor, they were instrumental in pushing the agenda for the adoption of Crown Colony government before and after emancipation. He was adamant that this was the way to go. He failed in abolishing the assemblies in 1839, but he did not fail. He did not fail in the aftermath of the Moran Bay Rebellion in Jamaica of 1865 to accommodate Edward Ears' request for the assembly to be abolished. Of course, it is said that the governor of Jamaica at the time, Governor Ayer, he frightened the members of the assembly into surrendering their political power. There are different, differing opinions in that regard. Essentially, some believe that Edward Ayer saved Jamaica and that he should be heralded as a hero. Others believe otherwise. Let us not forget the significant advancement of non-whites in Jamaican politics from emancipation to 1865, and primarily from 1844 with that significant election. Let us not forget that there were divided opinions at the colonial office regarding which was better, the old representative system of government or Crown Colony government. Let us also not forget that even after this significant development in Jamaica, some territories held out with regards to not accepting Crown Colony rule immediately. 
However, in the final analysis, Barbados was the only English speaking Caribbean territory that maintained the old representative form of government. Any questions? All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Miss Corniff. Um, You're welcome, Dr. Nelson. <laughs> there are no questions. I'm just checking um, on our YouTube channel to see if any of the viewers have any questions, but there are no, there are no questions. So um, thank you very much for an informative um, presentation. I learned a lot. I certainly learned a lot. I hope those who will be watching this will learn a lot as well. But I trust I so. <laughs> right. So I just want to remind um, our audience that the recordings for today, right, the sessions that we had um, since um, this morning, earlier this morning, the recordings will be will be posted on our YouTube page, History Uemona, so you can go back and view them while preparing for your exams. With that being said, we wish you all the very best in your upcoming exams and hope to see some of you soon. So take care.